From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives, struggling to reach the time of the gathering, when the few who remain will battle to the last. No one has ever known we were among you. Until now. Welcome to the Highlander Rewatch Podcast. Uh, we're really excited about this episode. We are tackling the very first Highlander motion picture. Um, maybe you're a new listener to the podcast since we're talking about the movie and you're a huge fan of the original 1986 Highlander. We just want to tell you a little bit about what this podcast is all about. Each and every week, we take a different piece of Highlander and we talk about it in detail, uh, whether it's from the show, whether it's from the show or the movie. There's only two things. Yeah. Well, anime. Yeah, there's the anime. There's all sorts of stuff. And yeah. obviously, we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface of what the Highlander universe is. Um, I'm one of your hosts. My name's Keith. This is Kyle. I'm another one of your rewatchers. And this is Eamon. We all, like, really love Highlander. That's why we started doing this podcast. So, also, if you haven't checked out, like, our previous podcast, go back and check out uh, all our Season 1 episodes. Plus, we've got a really cool interview with uh, the creative consultant and producer, David Abramowitz. Plus a bonus episode. Absolutely. Yeah, so if this is your first time checking us out, make sure to go back and listen to the rest, because it's all pretty good stuff. Even if you don't like Season 1, I think our episodes are pretty fun. What can you expect from this podcast? We are going to be getting into... We're going to kind of go beat by beat by the movie and talk about all the scenes. We are going to get into some behind-the-scenes stuff about casting, do some interviews with uh, the cast. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to kind of give a, our analysis of the movie Highlander and what we think about it. So we're excited uh, to revisit this movie over the next couple episodes. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I got into Highlander by watching the show, mostly. Um, and then I feel like I might have seen Highlander 2 or 3 first. I, I feel like... I did not see the original Highlander movie. And you still stuck with it, huh? (laughs) Yeah, I did. Uh, Because I remember liking the show a lot, and then I remember being at, like, our local video store and being like, oh, there's a movie? Like, I didn't, that wasn't even on my radar when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, cool. So we rented it, and it's, like, the sexiest movie of the year, if it was the third. Of 1995. (laughs) Wow. Or whatever. Uh, We got to check what other movies came out in 1995. To see if it truly is the the sexiest. sexiest. Yes. It's true. This is Highlander 3 would have been the sexiest movie in 1995, according to the box. Box art. Yeah. Very good. Uh, how did you guys get into Highlander or, or see the first movie? I uh, well, I started with the TV show, as I said before, on USA, watching it with my grandma. So, like, Adrian Paul is Highlander in my mind that he is who it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like, I, I didn't see the movie until recently. And, you know, I'm going to make a confession here. Like, when I first saw the movie, I didn't really like it that much. Now I have seen it maybe 10 times. I actually really like it, but at first I wasn't that impressed. I don't know why. Probably watched it maybe five years after I watched the show with my grandmother. It gotcha. was that long. I didn't even know it was a movie, embarrassingly. Yeah, I yeah. just thought it was a TV show. How about you, Kyle? My introduction is pretty similar to Eamon's. Also, just in terms of how strongly the show was rooted in my mind, then going back and seeing the the movie was a bit jarring for me. And I remember my initial take on the movie was loving the music and being like ho-hum on the movie i think i have a much stronger appreciation for the movie now and some of just like the just kind of embrace a lot of the craziness that goes on in it and that has like a real place in my heart now as like one of the flavors of highlander maybe not my favorite flavor of highlander (laughs) like the show at its height is still like the gold standard but there's definitely a place for like the zany kurgan and that kind of atmosphere in highlander and after watching the show it's kind of hard to not compare the two well the first time i saw the movie i kept on being like oh they do this kind of better in the tv show and you know now i'm like oh well this was done better in the movie so it's hard to compare sometimes yeah well i I think the thing that's hard is the highlander universe is so kind of dense like you have this thing with rules you're trying to develop like this whole mythos And that's really hard to do in a two-hour movie. Like, the amount of content to try to cram in kind of the show's version of this thing into a movie, that's a 
daunting task. And I think this this movie does a pretty good job of getting a lot of content into a pretty small window of time. Oh, it does. It does a Definitely. great job at that. And I, yeah. I know I remember uh, David Abramowitz, the show's producer, actually I think mentioned on our podcast that he always imagined that these two things were unrelated, like two separate right. universes, which I think is a good way to think about it because yeah. when, you, when you start to kind of piece these things together into a coherent universe, it becomes confusing and like kind of weird. So I'm good with just thinking about the movies on their own. Utterly confusing, because not to give away the end of the movie, but Connor wins. Right. right. He wins the game. Therefore, what is the TV show? Like, you brought yeah. that up on the, the, our, our pilot episode, is that, like, are we following a, a hero that will one day die because we know the end of the movie? Yeah. Right. right. Which would be a hilarious take on the show <laughs> if, like, from the very beginning they were, like, planting the seed that, like, the, the finale of the episode is Adrian Paul getting his head cut off, like... That would be amazing in <laughs> a certain would. in a certain way. Like yeah. it's like this cruel joke that's being played on you. <laughs> but no, that is not in fact what happens. And I agree that they should really be thought of as distinct entities, right? Especially should... when you get into the other movies, right? Oh yeah. Well, there's a weird thing. I don't know. This might be getting ahead of ourselves, but I, I watched some of the season two episodes, and um, Joe Dawson mentions, "Oh, thanks to Connor for getting rid of the Kurgan. He was a real bad guy," which is like. Oh kind of nuts so in the tv show universe the kurgan did exist but they didn't face each other right. as the last two immortals wow that's interesting i'm excited to delve into season two and also yeah. I, I should I mention it's... we're all rewatching. this is that's the the title of our show highlander rewatch so like right we've pretty much seen all the episodes but again in our youth <laughs> right uh, and now we're going back to kind of revisit the whole series and deliver some cynical adult hard-hitting analysis <laughs> that's <laughs> right, right. Uh, <laughs> on a fantasy show yeah <laughs> But that said, that seems like the smartest way to proceed. If you were trying to reconcile these two things, it's like, okay, all the events of the movie happened with just the editorial that it's still ongoing. It's not a, not That's not it. Like, yeah. right. there are more immortals left. It almost look, It's almost like our gag that uh, one of the theories we had discussed on how the gathering works, which for those who aren't quite plugged in, the gathering is when there's few immortals left, they feel like a, a pull to go to a, a certain location to fight it out, that there's like sub-tournaments. <laughs> it's like a, yeah. a March Madness bracket. Yeah, right. it's like, oh, you go to this city, you fight, and then the ones who are left feel a compelling urge to move on. So maybe the first movie, <laughs> Connor wins the New York bracket right. and then has to He's move on. He's moved to see Coover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So why don't we jump in with kind of the uh, nuts and bolts of what Highlander is and get into the the info on it. So Highlander was originally released on March 7th, 1986. Just to paint a picture, Reagan was president. Uh, the Challenger disaster had just happened a few months prior. Oh, boy. Uh, just to give you an idea of like the movie climate at the time, uh, like a week before Highlander came out, Pretty in Pink was in the box office. Right. Was... It lo- that was number one at the box office. Yeah. So uh... Highlander was number seven or eight. I think so. It lost to Pretty in Pink, House, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, The Color Purple, Hannah and Her Sisters, and a movie called Wild Cats. <laughs> <laughs> so not an auspicious launch to this movie. This uh, movie was directed by Russell Mulcahy. He's an Australian director, mostly known for music videos. Things you might know him from are Duran Duran's Rio. Oh. Um, tons of Elton John videos. I think he did like 20 Elton John videos. Damn. Some Spandau Ballet. Uh, oh. Ooh. Yeah, which uh, we've talked about on this podcast before. Martin yeah. Kemp. The Avenging the Angel. Right. Uh, he did their video for True, which honestly is a pretty boring video. True. <laughs> <laughs> no, true. Not my favorite Spandau Ballet song, although mm. I do love that band. He also did uh, some Queen videos. It's a kind of magic. Oh. Princess of the Universe, uh, which of course are from this movie. Which feature Christopher Lambert. Looking very serious. Yeah. He looks like he's having no fun in that video. Yeah. He looks sad. Yeah. Oh, one of his biggest claims of fame is he kind of directed what you could call, I guess, the first music video. Video Killed the Radio Star, which was the first video actually aired on MTV, which is pretty cool. And so this is his second feature. His first, what is it, Razorback? Razorback, which is about yeah. like a killer pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, was, uh, this movie was written by Gregory Wyden. 
Um, and he actually wrote this as a student. Yeah, uh, as a class assignment, allegedly, while he was going to UCLA. So let's kick it off. Who's in this movie? So Christoph Lambert is in this movie. And so this is like really his only like second big movie. The first one was Greystroke, which is the legend of Tarzan. Yeah, I was reading a lot about this movie because every article references Greystoke. I've never seen it. Have you, either of you seen no, it? No, I haven't. I kept meaning to watch it. I it was gotcha. nominated for lots of Academy Awards. Hmm. Robert Town, who wrote Chinatown, wrote oh. that movie, and he wrote it. He got in an argument and said, all right, the name on this movie is my dog's name, P.H. Vozak, and he got nominated for an Academy Award for Best Screenplay, <laughs> and it was his dog's name, like, on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was interesting. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's really funny. But yeah, he's been in some stuff. He's more of a more famous as a French and like international movie actor than Yeah. Uh than he was kind of on a made hot streak over here. around this time or like yeah. after like early 90s like he was in the Mortal Kombat movie. N- nothing quenches a hot streak like being Raiden yeah. in Mortal Kombat. Which was written by Kevin Droney, who yeah. was uh, one of the producers on Highlander and wrote a bunch of episodes. So, At the time of Lambert's casting this movie, I read this. Lambert has been called the sexiest actor in movies today. Yeah. What I... the fuck? <laughs> Obviously, we are three dudes. I don't know if anyone <laughs> wants to weigh in on this. I actually would love but... to hear about that. Like, I, yeah. I would, too, just because, like... Adrian Paul is like a kind of a beautiful man. Like it's obvious. Like if someone says like classically Ad- attractive. Yeah, it's like if when people are like, "Oh, Adrian Paul, like sexiest man alive today." But like, all right, fine. Like I'm not going to necessarily weigh in, but sure. <laughs> like Christopher Lambert, I was like, really? Yeah, he has an interesting look to him. Yeah, well, which maybe that's to his credit. Yeah. Like he's like he's not like a traditional looking guy. He's like intense. Maybe that's what seals it. Yeah, he's got really interesting eyes, and that's actually the the byproduct of his, like, nearsightedness. His myopia. Yeah, Yeah. uh, which makes him, like, almost blind, essentially. So I think he has kind of this odd gaze about him because he can't see anything. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which is fascinating. Yeah. The other weird thing is Lambert was almost going to be James Bond in The Living Daylights, which is insane to me. I can't imagine where that series would have gone. Down the toilet. (laughs) Yeah, let's be, well, it would have been odd. Let's be nice, though. Also, he turned down the role of Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon, yeah. yes. which is insane to me. Again, imagine yep. what that series would be like. Imagine what Mel Gibson's career would be like if he wasn't in that movie. Because that yeah. was like another kind of height of his power, kind of like that cemented him as a real action star. Mm. That could have been Lambert's, Lambert smashing his uh, shoulder back into place. Yeah. Also, I, I was doing some research on what Christoph's been up to more recently. So he's been like... He had a long stint on NCIS, I think, as the villain uh, yeah. of the show, which looked interesting. Uh, but then he's in a movie, and I have to see this. It's a 2013 movie called Bloodshot, and he plays the president of the United States. What? Because, of course, that makes sense. Huh? Yeah. yeah. But it is about a vampire that goes undercover to take down some terrorists with the help of a rogue cop. What? And, Say that again? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh but it also features like more brown face than I am comfortable with, like because it uh, looks like which is any amount, any yeah. amount yeah. of brown face, <laughs> any amount of brown face, because it looks like they could not get, I guess, some like Middle Eastern people to play those parts, so they've maybe put some uh, brown makeup on some white people. Great. Does anyone get the impression like he's probably a lot of fun in real life? Yeah, he seems like a fun, kooky guy. Yeah, like it doesn't necessarily. That's not the character he's playing, but like just enough of like him bleeds through. It's like you know, this guy seems like he's fun to hang out with. Totally. And like apparently, him and Sean Connery like were best buds instantly Missed. upon meeting to film this thing. Yeah, it's and like, are still friends, I believe. So yeah, Sean Connery's also in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Sean Connery's in this movie. I mean, there's too much to say about Sean Connery, and everyone knows who he is. I yep. don't know what else to say. Well, I think He got a million is... bucks for seven days of shooting. I was looking for more info on this. I heard a rumor that he donated his proceedings from this movie to Scotland, and that was like a... Like, it was... It had something to do with, like, this movie will make Scotland look good. Huh. And it does. And this... it does, yeah. Yeah. Um, this movie, like, some of the... Just kind of natural beauty kind of shots they managed to get are pretty stunning. I kept on thinking, like, oh, I want to go to there. <laughs> then Clancy Brown is the villain. Yeah. Uh, 
He's, I think, the standout performance in this movie. Yeah, um, he crushes it in this yeah. movie. And he probably has, like, kind of maybe the most illustrious career of anyone in this movie. Maybe well, aside from Sean Connery. Yeah, aside from Sean Connery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, did a... 241 acting credits on Ooh. IMDb. Yeah. But he's in a ton of... He does a ton of voice acting. He's also in the Coen Brothers movie that is dropping, basically, as we speak, Hail Caesar. Right, with yeah. Christophe Lambert, which yeah. is, I think, totally intentional casting by... Uh, the Coen brothers to have both of those people in this movie. Like, they, they clearly know the connection. I wonder if they share a scene. That would be kind of cool. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that movie. And then I guess maybe his most famous role at this point, isn't he Mr. Krabs in yeah. SpongeBob SquarePants? Like That might be his most that's guess, like, recognizable thing for... Who is? Like, Clancy, Clancy Brown. Brown. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah so that... <laughs> That might be his biggest role at this point. Yeah. That blew my fucking mind. I don't know how, like, I didn't come across that. He I, I always see him as Lex Luthor. Me too. That's, that's yeah, like, yeah. that is maybe the quintessential Lex Luthor for me. It is. Yeah. He's the best. This is in all, like, the Bruce Tim animated Superman stuff. I know he was, uh, like, he was apprehensive about doing this role because of the yeah. prosthetics. Uh, yeah. He had worked on the movie The Bride before this, which stars Sting. Uh, it's like a Frankenstein story. He was the monster, and he got, like terrible allergic reactions to the makeup so he didn't want to do this movie because it would require some prosthesis uh but they worked it out and it, and it looks great like it does he goes through a lot of the movie with this giant scar on his neck and it is badass so the tagline of this movie there's three uh there's one that is he Ooh. fought his first battle on the skylish Hotl- hotlands highlands in 1536 he will fight his greatest battle on the streets of new york city in 1986 his name is connor mcleod he is immortal. That's a long tagline. It is. Oh, I guess that was what was on the poster. Although I think that's it, a lot for a poster, even. <laughs> well, I think it's that's better. a lot for a billboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's better than the other ones, which are just wow. there can be only one. That's good. And don't lose your head. Uh, but, but of course, at this time, like there is no Highlander mythology. Like no one knows what Highlander is. So to see a poster that just says "Don't lose your head." I disagree. If you have two guys sword fighting, or it's apparent that two guys are going to fight, Don't Lose Your Head has independent meaning that then is paid off when you see the movie. That it- would be true. However, let me describe the original poster for you. <laughs> it uh, It is just a black and white photo of Christopher, Christopher Lambert. Lambert face uh looking basically like a serial killer it, <laughs> it looks if, if anyone's ever seen the uh now classic bad movie the room with tommy wiseau and knows the cover or poster of that movie that's what the highlander poster looked like can you ever really trust anyone <laughs> is the tagline on the room yeah uh it's an odd bit of marketing uh so in that case i actually like the he fought his first but like that at least gives you a gateway into what this could be because uh, otherwise, it's like, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know. Those seem like perfectly good taglines if it's obvious this is a movie oh, with sword totally. fighting in it. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening to the Highlander Rewatch podcast. If you're fans of this podcast, uh, make sure to follow us on Facebook. Just like Highlander Rewatch on Facebook. And we always are posting stuff, uh, behind the scenes info, fun video compilations, um, just our general thoughts on Highlander. And of course, you get to interact with fans of the Highlander community worldwide, which is one of the coolest parts of Highlander fandom. So make sure to like Highlander Rewatch on Facebook. So should we kick it off by talking about that opening scroll that we played to bring in the show? Sean Connery is kind of explaining to us sort of the premise of this movie. Right. And it, he allegedly recorded this in a bathroom? Yeah, he recorded this in a bathroom. It's uh, got this weird echo, like, hollow sound to it. It's very yeah. odd. And apparently, like, I guess when the producers heard this, they they heard it over the telephone, so they couldn't tell the sound quality was poor. So they were like, oh, sure, that's good. And it's like, it's got this weird kind of tinny quality to it yeah uh which is funny um but i think this opening kind of crawl i guess you could call it it doesn't really crawl anywhere but opening uh card uh does a pretty good job kyle i know you you always ragged on the series opening sequence like how do you think this compares to that i give this one more of a pass again i don't think it's necessarily necessarily clear like compare it to like the ultimate title card which is the opening s- s- crawl in the first Star Wars movie. That sets it up. Like, you know what's going on. Here, though, there are a bunch of, like, weird magical concepts. Like, it's not a fact-based thing. Like, they're <laughs> dropping vocabulary that you need for this movie. Like, they use the term 
gathering. They use the... It's not clear at all what this is about. And the exposition of that unfolds so slowly over the course of the movie. Like, you don't even know that there's a prize or a battle in this until about halfway through the movie. That's true. Like, this expo- exposition in this movie comes in drips and drabs. Yeah. And I feel like this title card was a way to, like, get the ball rolling a little bit. Mm. And I think it just kind of adds to the confusion. Also, at one point, there's an ellipsis with, like, six periods yes, in it. Yeah. <laughs> so many dots! <laughs> and I don't know why they chose to do that, but I laughed out loud when I saw it. It could also be that I believe this was also supposed to be temporary. Yeah, like these these cards were just made as like placeholders, and then the producers or whoever were like, "Oh yeah, these are cool because it's red." I guess yeah, I don't Russell know. McKay, he did not like them. Like yeah. it was like they weren't supposed to be red; they were supposed to maybe be a little more stylized or something. But yeah, this was not the final product. But I guess they probably ran out of time or money and just left them there. Yeah, it's a little. Or, yeah, or the producers liked them enough. Them. Yeah, it's a little odd. And then there's also this kind of fourth wall breaking element to it that I don't understand. Like Sean Connery is literally talking to you, the That's audience. True. No one's ever known that we were among you until now. But right. that narrative style never comes back. Like you are never addressed as the audience again. Right. And that's odd. So I don't know. I think this could have been tighter actually revealed more information or just said like fuck it and make it completely thematic in a certain way Mm -hmm. but instead it like creates this weird hybrid where it's like you're supposed to be getting information from this but none of it pays off until like an hour later (laughs) right and that's odd that's a very strange i did want to bring one thing up uh which is that there's there's a lot of versions of this movie so i think we should just mention like how we watched it because i think that's kind of important uh so I'll, i'll start off i watched it a couple times to prepare for the podcast um, so I watched it on, let's see, the two DVD versions I have, which is one was the original like 10th anniversary uh, version, uh, which I think is a transfer from the Laserdisc. Then I watched the Immortal version, which I think is a different, uh, which actually I'm positive is a different print. Uh, and then also the Blu-ray version, which is, I believe, the same print as that Immortal edition. So there's like a number of different things floating out there. And these are all the, I guess, uh, director's cut. Um, there's no way to get, I think, the original theatrical version anymore. So how'd you guys watch it? Uh, I watched it on Hulu. If my understanding of this cor- is correct, it is just the director's cut again. Right. I know from talking to you, mostly, uh, that the original cut that you would have seen from the Laserdisc has a lot of sound issues. That's there was what n- I found, yeah. There was nothing like that in the version that's up on Hulu. Um, it sounds great. Also, if you want to watch this movie, go watch it on Hulu. Yeah. I mean, Eamon, how did you see this? Also on Hulu? Also Hulu, yes. Okay. Oh, here's also another interesting thing that I noticed when I was watching the different versions. Did your version say Canon Films at the beginning? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's really interesting. So uh, when you watch the original Laserdisc version, it does not say Canon Films. Uh, Hmm. And so the first cut I watched was the Blu-ray. And I was like, Canon Films? I don't remember this being produced by them. Yeah, we should talk about Canon Films yeah, so for a minute. So if you don't know who Canon Films are, it was this kind of notorious Hollywood studio run by these two guys from Israel uh, that would just kind of like take like a, a hot idea or a trend and just churn out a movie for as cheap as possible. And every once in a while, they'd kind of hit on gold and make some money. Uh, but it was really kind of just like a cash grab. Like these are like D level movies. Uh, is, we're talking Masters of the Universe, Superman, Superman Four. 4. Yeah. Oh. Did they do Over the Top? Yes, Over the Top. Yeah. Um, a lot of kind of classic bad 80s movies. Um, that They they like, uh, oh, all the uh, Death Proof. Not right. Death Proof, excuse me. Um, Death Wish. Death, Death Wish. Wish, yeah, Charles uh, Bronson. Charles yeah. Bronson movies. Which, I don't think they, did they do the first one? No, or? not the no. first one. They yeah. did the yeah. sequels, yeah. Um, yeah. But they also kind of launched Chuck Norris's career with a bunch of kind of shoot 'em up Oh, the Delta action. Force. Yeah, the Delta Force yeah. movies. Um, so, Definitely watch their catalog. It's totally fun. And watch the documentary about them on Netflix. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Electric yeah. Boogaloo, which yeah. is another one of their movies. So when I saw this, this their their logo come up, I was like, oh my god, Like they made this movie? Like This is crazy. Um, but then I was checking out the other cut, the Laserdisc version, and their logo does not appear. So I was like, wait, what's going on? Like, uh, So it's because of the prints they used, and I guess they just didn't take off the Canon Films logo. So... After Highlander was released in the, the, the movies, it was actually produced by a UK company called EMI Productions, and they funded basically the whole movie. Hmm. However, a week after the movie came out, I don't know if the movie actually kind of bankrupt them because it didn't do too well in the US. They sold all their holdings to this guy, Alan Bond, in April of 86. And then he, in turn, like a week or two later, sold all of it to Canon. 
So that laser disc, I believe, is re- that print is released under the Canon umbrella because it was before they went bankrupt. Ah. So then that was then in turn bought by, I guess, what, Republic Pictures? And like it ends up being like kind of a subsidiary of NBC now, like Studio Canal, I think is hmm. the logo on it now. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, I guess the Blu ray print, I think, still has the Canon Films logo on it because I think that's the film print they use for the transfer. So I thought that was interesting. So it is not a canon film, which I was relieved to know. I, that was, like, shocking. When I saw it came, come up, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Compared to that catalog, this is, like, Oscar-worthy right. <laughs> material. <laughs> Tell me, He-Man, is the loneliness of evil as lonely as the loneliness of good? <laughs> Actual quote from canon films. Oh, Skeletor. So, after this opening title card, the music kicks in. Yeah. Which is awesome. So yeah. It's Queen, Princes of the Universe. Which is, I guess, the theme song, as it were, to Highlander. Yes, and becomes the opening theme to Highlander the show. Right. Uh, so yeah, let's let's listen to a clip um, with Queen guitarist. It's uh, Brian May and the bass player John Deacon talk about how they got involved in the making of Highlander. We actually said no because um, we just didn't want to be. Uh, we wanted a rest, to be honest. And then we saw about 20 minutes cut of this Highlander film and thought, great, that's, that's us. Now, we, we had the scripts and we went to see very, you know, quite a lot of the footage that they got already. And then we all went away and all tried to write songs for various bits. So that's how they kind of got started, which is interesting. We'll, we'll talk more about the music as we get to the, the different cues. Uh, but I think Princess of the Universe is a great song. And it gets used, it basically is the theme song of the franchise. It's used in most of the iterations of it. Yeah, and it, it really kind of gets you pumped to watch this movie. It's, yeah. a, it's a good lead in. Definitely. Super pumped. When it came on, I was just like, yeah. I know. It's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought the font choice of Highlander was interesting. Like, we brought this up when we talked about the the series a little bit. Like, this font is not what was the, like, marketing font and what we now know of as, I guess, the Highlander movie font, which is that, like, it's kind of got, like, an electric N. Right. I thought it was just odd that it's like, oh, that's not in the movie. Like, again, I guess because these are placeholders that they didn't use that font. And then also I noticed on, like, the DVD boxes, those are different, too. Like, the 10th anniversary uh, Laserdisc thing has a completely different font that is not the series, not the movie, not this thing. Like, it's a it's a whole new thing. Uh, Typeface rewatched. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. The, the <laughs> font thing, like, bugs me from, like, a marketing standpoint. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's good to have, like, a logo, like, a yeah. consistent <laughs> thing for your movie. Like, Helvetica rewatched. Yeah. That's right. I mean, imagine if Star Wars just changed the, like, the iconic yeah. logo yeah. every single movie. That is a fair point. <laughs> so we're opening at Madison Square Garden. There's an interesting wrestling match in which you're going to see a guy who looks who's wearing a sequined robe with just the battle flag of Northern Virginia on it. The Confederate flag, as yep. it's kind of colloquially called inaccurately. And he just, he looks like the big bad dog. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the dog. So I think this is the the fabulous Freebirds. Yeah, the so, fabulous yeah, Freebirds. I couldn't find his name on it. He's the fabulous Freebird. And these are real wrestlers, right? Yeah, this is all like real. Like, yeah, it's all real. It's all real <laughs> like, wrestling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and this dude is like lecherous. He's right. like taking off his confederate flag robe and then it cuts to this creepy little girl like trying to touch her tongue to her nose and the cut between the two of them is weird <laughs> so this was supposed to be uh, to hockey it's supposed hockey, to be a hockey match, a hockey match yeah. in the original script but the nhl would not allow them to film because the entire point of this scene is like about violent like right amped up violence of it so that's all they were going to be showing for the hockey match was how violent it was and the nhl was like no thanks uh, so they do a wrestling one, which I think is fun. Like, I don't mind the wrestling opening, no. I suppose. I think the hockey, their original idea, I think, is better. I think hockey, because it's, so organi- it's so much more organized. Yeah. Uh, and you've got, like, teams fighting. It's, like, a better analogy, but it still works. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. There's an amazing shot over this whole arena, and they packed this fucking place. Like, they packed it. And it's, it's like an aerial shot, so it goes over the crowd, over the ring, and then it zooms into this one mass of cheering people, and there's one dude there who's not participating in this fervor. And yeah, it's a it's a really cool shot. It actually was invented by the guy who invented the Steadicam. Oh. Trivia. <laughs> uh, Garrett Brown. Uh, he invented it for the movie Bound for Glory, starring David Carradine, uh, which is about Woody Guthrie in the Dust Bowl. Huh. Huh. Yeah, but yeah, this is kind of one of his uh, achievements. Not as famous as the Steadicam. Yeah, 
also the the shot of Connor is great. Also, he's awesome. like everyone is like in a mad fervor, and yeah. he's like got this death stare on. And they do something weird with the lighting. He's like yeah. literally shrouded in darkness. Yeah, except for like his eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really cool the way th- I think this whole opening sequence. It's is amazing. Like pretty, this is a, a really nice opening to a movie. It's yeah. captivating. It's like who's this guy? What what's his deal? And Lambert does do that look really well. And then like the interstitial cuts to like the battlefield. I think work really well. Like yeah. this is a gripping opening. Yeah, so yeah, it's cutting back and forth between wrestling and then we're seeing like cuts of like clansmen fighting. fighting. And yeah. so not knowing what this movie is about, like I was trying to put myself Ancient in Scottish that. clansmen, yeah, not yeah. racist. I was trying to put myself in the yeah. <laughs> 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 I was trying to put myself in the headspace of like not knowing anything about this, and it's like, yeah, this would be confusing. I think in a not confusing, but like interesting in a good way. It's like because you see these two like juxtaposed images that obviously have to do with violence, and it's like, oh, what's going on here? Like we've got these kind of two battles going on, and then so Lambert ends up kind of just getting up and leaving. Again, we're not sure what's going on. As we find out later, Connor, this character, is immortal, so he gets up and leaves the wrestling match. I, I had some kind of questions about this. I was curious, like, why did he leave? Like, is he having a PTSD? That was my interpretation, is that he's like, I can't deal with this anymore. Like, because he seems, like, completely on edge. Because, like, this the, the this fan behind him, like, grabs his shoulder, and he, like, right. he snaps over to him. Like, it's like he's getting taken out of a trance. And I kind of had this idea that this was, like, he was having these flashbacks watching this wrestling match and it was not good for him and so he was like i'm out of here yeah he's getting like grabbed by this guy who looks like harry potter's uncle (laughs) in the harry potter movies rest in peace (laughs) yeah Uh, (laughs) oh one of the dursleys yeah 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 (laughs) he does look like a dursley (laughs) he's just like shouting at him like ah you see that what a great fight (laughs) yeah Ah. you're gonna kill him Ah." (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but no that is an interesting interpretation of why he leaves. I thought he was getting, if you had knowledge of it, it's like he's getting the immortal Spidey sense, which works a little differently in this movie. Right. But I thought that was why he gets up to go. But it makes a lot of sense that he's just like sick of violence and death. And oh, then that also made me question, why is he there in the first place? <laughs> right. I'm like, why did he yeah. go? Like, well, he clearly went there to meet this guy. I like, don't know about that. I don't think so. I am a hundred percent sure. Of that. Okay. So let's, let's, let's get, let's move on, I guess, to the, to the next scene. Oh, and also we should mention that these these like cuts of the Scottish Highlands are not present in the American version. Oh, really? What? No, like these these very quick flashbacks. Like, oh, that's what that's part of what makes this scene so awesome. It, like yeah. that, that shot we talked about is great, but yeah. that's what sells this whole thing. Totally. That's insane, isn't that, that insane? Like, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll get into actually. Let, let's just preface this right now. So we're going to be talking about like essentially two cuts of this movie. There is the director's cut, which for all intents and purposes is the European or international release. And then there's the American cut of the movie. And so if you're wondering why there's an American cut, it's because this production company, EMI, they controlled all the international releases for Highlander. However, the U.S. release was purchased by 20th Century Fox. So Fox, as the distributor, had issues with some parts of the movie. And so they cut the movie up. So that's why there's two cuts. And it also might explain why this movie got an interesting reaction from critics and moviegoers but we'll get into that later uh hmm. so yeah that's what we're going to be talking about is the 20th century fox cut is the u.s version well alternate interpretation that we'll find about later find out about later is maybe he's just going down to the garage to get a blowjob <laughs> yeah. it's cruising for some ass <laughs> Hey, rewatchers out there, if you haven't already, subscribe to us on iTunes. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, and while you're at it, write us a five star review. We really appreciate it. Thanks from all your rewatchers, Kyle, Eamon, and Keith. Uh, so, Connor goes downstairs to the parking garage, which was actually a, a vegetable. Like a produce market in London? It looks a lot like a garage. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. they, really they did a like, great job. Yeah, they really yeah. tricked it out. And I guess the reason was they couldn't find a parking garage that had a high enough ceiling to be able to do, like, the stunts. And, like, you know, I mean, parking garages have notoriously low ceilings, especially right. in America. And poor lighting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so th- they, like, tricked out a vegetable stand. And this whole thing took, uh, like, a week to shoot, which is crazy. Like, yeah. They spent a lot of time on this fight scene and i guess it shows it is pretty like complicated like oh it's very uh, there's a lot of cuts actually apparently at the time of the dvd recording of the director's commentary this scene had the most cuts in a reel like they held held the record for cuts per reel so 
thought that was well, impressive. Yeah. Huh. Which is obviously a lot more complicated back then when you had to actually like get out your scissors and snip film yeah. as opposed to like now cuts are fast and furious. Right. But. And again, we should mention that yeah, uh, Mulcahy was a music video director, so that leads to like I mean, music videos are fast paced. Like, right. Uh, this 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 movie does have all those sort of music video styles to it. So uh, Connor's walking in this parking lot, and uh, suddenly Here's a man it. appears behind him. And goes, McCloud! In and silver aviator glasses. Yeah, this guy looks like Donald Trump to me. Yes, he looks yeah. like, <laughs> my he's note so is not that, threatening. Yeah. My note is he looks like Michael McKeon if he were in the movie <laughs> Top Gun. <laughs> That's good. He's, he's wearing yeah. a suit with aviator glasses, and he kind of looks like not a young Michael McKean, but like a middle-aged Michael McKean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but apparently he's actually the stunt director for this movie. Oh. Hmm. And he was the stand-in for Sean Connery in his uh, stunts, oh. which was interesting. But here's Kyle. You mentioned that he, you think he's going down there to meet this guy. Yes, absolutely. I don't think so, because when this guy comes out and says, McLeod, uh, Connor says, wait. That that led me to believe, like, I am i don't want to fight you. I'm not here for you. I, was thinking, I don't think he's there for it. I paused on this and thought a lot about that line. I am less inclined to think it means that. I don't know what. <laughs> let, me put it with, let me put it this way. Throughout this movie, we really don't ever see Connor shy away from violence. Ever. Anywhere in this movie, essentially. Insofar as he, he's certainly not protesting that hard. The word, I don't think we should read too much into the word wait, I guess. He just says, wait. <laughs> and that's <laughs> it. And then it's like time to sword fight. Again, he looks so utterly bored. Like, why is he going to a wrestling match? He, d- he looks like he's enjoying this not at all. Right. He even complains about it later in the movie. Hmm. So I think that it was somehow arranged, or they both knew that one another would... Would be there? Would be there. Because why is he going down to this parking garage at that exact moment? Like To get this, his car. This other guy just happened to know... He also brought his sword with him. Did this other guy just happen to know, oh yeah, McCloud's such a wrestling fanatic that he's <laughs> going to be there? I don't know. It seems arranged to hmm. me. Or like they both are aware of this. Also, the fact that in this version, the gathering seems to have this more magical quality where like they're drawn to places for the purposes of fighting. Mm-hmm. It could even just be that. Mm-hmm. That there's like this factor forcing them to fight. Because it also seems like in this movie, fights are like preordained. Like the, the battle, we can talk about this more when the other fight scenes come up. But the environment is almost reacting to the fights before they're over, if that makes sense. Like, there are storms that are going on as they fight. Like, the storms are interacting with them this is mm, true. as right. they are fighting. It's like, there's, like, this magical confluence when they're going to fight. Also, side note, what the fuck is this guy's name? Vasil. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. I listened to it three times, yeah. and I came up with Vasil, Vassal, v- <laughs> Vassini. I am waiting for Vassini. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The seal. I like to think he's the seal. Yeah. That's his code name. I don't know. <laughs> so they, they, I guess, have a fight, which opens with, of course, the most deadly move, a coat throw. The jacket, That's right. Which, yeah, which of course, the seems very coat effective throw. as always. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's like Carlos Zandaro in <laughs> uh, Saving Grace. Yeah. You know, because of the way he highlights the jacket, <laughs> the jacket's going to be part of this. Uh, so I think this is shot really, like, interestingly. Like, and actually, as, as a thing that we'll see, like, throughout most of the movie, like, Mulcahy shoots a lot of stuff like low. Yeah. He doesn't shoot waist up. Like he's kind of always like just below your waist. So you always see like a lot of the ceiling. Like it gives this kind of odd grand feel to things. Like there's a lot of, just a lot of ceiling and sky in his shots, which is kind of interesting. Um, and this, this scene has a lot of ambiance. Like, as you said, Kyle, like the environment tends to react. So like the lights are flick, like when they get together, like suddenly the lights start like freaking out and stuff. Which right. It's cool. Yeah. Um, Throughout this movie in a way that's not apparent in the show, it's very clear. There's like magic afoot. Oh yeah. And they use the line. It's a kind of magic, like, three times in this movie or four Mm -hmm. but there's a much stronger mystical element to this whole thing yeah i I was even kind of interpreting it as like because anytime they seem to be together there's like electricity i was like oh is like is there even like a tangible like magnetism drawing them like they're actually being pulled together by like this electrical force or something yeah Uh, which i thought was a fun thing yeah this yeah this is a really cool fight it's exciting They, they it's it's varied they do a lot 
Like, there's one awesome scene where his av- aviators get smacked off his head, which, if and you, you see him retreating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which if you were wondering why he's wearing aviators indoors, it was so they could get that That's shot. Yep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a cool shot. I yeah. mean, but literally, you're in a parking garage. Like, you yep. probably can't see if you're wearing aviators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an extremely dark parking lot. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the fight is really cool. Um, I wanted to mention the sound design here, because this is the first time you really get a feel for what the swords sound like. I I keep going back and forth whether I I'm into it or not. Like I, it's really over the top, and I like that about it. Like it's it's almost like musical the the, the way the swords clash together. Mm. It's like percussive, and yeah. it like the the it like reverberates. Yeah, it's like it, whooshing. Yeah, it, yeah. Like, it doesn't project. sound real. It sounds like they're like effects for like a video game. But I think this is where I had a, a problem with it. It's like I like that they're over the top, but I don't like that they're not the greatest. Like it feels like a video game. Like there's four sound cues mm-hmm. and we're just going to keep recycling them over and over and like the edits on them aren't always like super clean. Mm. Uh so I just kind of I felt like it it wasn't as polished as it could have been. Um or the sounds they used just weren't uh, the best sounds, uh, but I, I like the idea that they're like it's, it's got this like really grand quality to it. Yeah, well, also just to just mirroring that is the way the sparks and electricity works with their swords. Yeah. So this is something that carries over into the show a little bit, but it's like amped up to ten in the movie. Their swords are all hooked up to car batteries, basically. So right. every time they encounter something else that's metal, they spark like right. crazy. Yeah. Like at one point, Connor's sword is just kind of resting on a car, and it's just going like <laughs> <laughs> the entire time. But it's like again adds this sort of like magical component to this thing. Like they're not just two dudes with swords fighting. Like there is yeah. a supernatural component even permeating like their normal fight sequence that's going on. Right. Because every time it happens, like there's sparks, like nuts. Yep. And it's pretty cool. The sparks are cool. Like, yeah, it's fun. A lot better than the TV show. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, it's a big movie, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so and they're running on cars and stuff. Yeah, like, they're like, like fun. Yeah, honestly. they're running after each other on the hoods of the cars, and that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so Connor ends up losing his sword at one point. It gets yep. kicked under a car, and so he fights with a pipe. Yep. Which I thought was cool. Yeah. Uh, this is the first for first of two times. Where, three, three. Three. Three times Con- <laughs> Connor fights with a pipe. He is, This is the true pipe man begins. Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> uh, so then we are introduced to one of the most absurd things to happen in this fight scene. I love it. Facile flips away. Yeah. He's just backflipping. Just a man in a three-piece backflipping. Yep. Oh, like, but for no re- like, this isn't like he's dodging an attack. Yeah, or back flipping. I don't like, know why he's doing it. Like Connor is hiding behind a car. Yeah, he appears over the hood only to see Fazil doing dozens of backflips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't care. I love this. Shot. I love it too. It, I don't know it's why. Great. It's, it's very silly. It's but. Totally <laughs> ridiculous. It reminded uh, me of Catwoman and Batman Returns. Yes. Like, did Burton just rip that off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this was another thing that was cut from the U.S. version. Oh. They were like no huh. backflips. So this cut, this this fight was trimmed down for the uh, the Fox release. I guess if you're gonna cut something, cut the backflips. Yeah. yeah, it adds to his character though. I'm just like this is just this weird looking aviator dude who can also do backflips. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we know nothing about this guy. Yeah, we know Which, nothing we should... about anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. We we know yeah. a guy. Like we've hear, heard the opening title that there's immortals. Yeah. We don't know that they have to fight each other, or do we? Like, we tra- fight to the last. Oh, we fight to the yeah. last, and then so. Which still, that's an unclear sentence. Yep. Right. Uh, so I guess we presume these two people are immortal because of that sentence. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. It's like this is all they know each other, right? Yeah. He yeah. says they he they know each other's names, right? And not at this point. Christopher Lambert is operating under the name Russell Nash. He's like, nah, he doesn't go Nash. He says McLeod. Like, right. he knows his real name. Yeah, exactly. It's confusing to know what's going on right here. But that's like a little bit of character building. I feel like I know more about this guy because he's the kind of guy who backflips during a fight. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually appreciate, like, this, that's something this movie does pretty well is it just gives you little tidbits of stuff. And I feel like that's an older thing that movies yeah. do, which I like. And it's it's not really that apparent in movies anymore. Like... There's this kind of, like, Christopher Nolan sort of, like, everything has to pay off very specific. Like, it's... Right. Like, we, we've actually, I think, delved into, like, a new version of, like, formulaic filmmaking. Like, I don't want to get into all that. <laughs> but, uh, like, movies movies have to have these very specific setups and payoffs. And 
it's it's very structured and there's like all these little tidbits like this guy backflips and it's like why it's like i don't know but like that's okay like there's a lot of things in this movie We're, that are just like huh i wonder what that's about like there's there's a story we don't hear about star wars is the same way i feel like like that's a, a another older movie that just has like things thrown about that are interesting they're building I, a I, world yeah yeah i think that you've said something that's accurate i don't know that this is an example of it oh, okay uh, I agree that like the the whole introduction payoff thing is way stronger now than it ever was, and there are like a lot more dangling threads in older movies. I don't know that this guy backflipping is a significant it's, enough no, portion. No, but of there's it. other parts of this movie that I think are are just kind of there, dangling yeah. threads that you, you have a question about. There's a there's a whole story that you don't know about. Yeah. So should we talk about how this this fight ends? Sure. It's odd. <laughs> So Connor just like pops out behind a pole. I guess like they spar for just a second. He gets rid of Fazil's sword and then he just lops his head off. Yep. And again, I was trying to put myself in the mindset of because again, this opening title card has not told you how they can die at all. Like it just says we fight to the last. Right. I guess you could assume even that like, well, you're immortal unless someone shoots you. Like, you know what I mean? Like you never die naturally, but you could die. Uh, anyway, it was just like, oh, I guess there's beheadings in this movie. Like right away. Yeah. Like, and, like, this shit is cold-blooded. Cause oh, just, yeah. Just tapping into what you said where he just goes, wait. Like, yeah. <laughs> at the beginning of this fight, he disarms him, no hesitation, cuts his head off. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's not like, hey, you've got one chance to walk away. There's no dialogue. We've heard the main character of this movie say two words. Yeah, a name say, and wait. <laughs> he said, Fasil, Vazini, Vazin, Salami. <laughs> he says one word, and then he says, wait. And that's it. And then he cuts this man's head off. Yeah. Wordlessly. Yeah. So at this point in the movie, I have no sense that he's like reluctant or doesn't want to fight this guy. And I suppose we also don't even know if he's the hero of the movie or not. Yeah. Like we, we also could be being introduced to the villain. He could be a bad movie. guy. He could be yeah. the villain of the movie that we see first. Also, to be clear, I'm going to stake this position out later. He is not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that flag now and we can revisit it whenever you care to. Sure. Hey everybody, this might be the first time that a rewatch podcast you've listened to. Uh, if it is and you like what you hear, just go on iTunes or whatever podcasting app you're using and click on the subscribe button. That's right, Highlander Rewatch has brand new content each and every week. I think it's cool when he cuts his head off how his sword gets like fucking stuck in the pillar right like i was like that's awesome it like, is yeah. awesome how fucking sharp is that sword though yeah right? yeah um, again it's like so over the top like, yeah and also i mean i maybe it's a maybe it's also a reflection of how we view movies today like i think we view them a little more ironically like we're like well that could never happen and like you know what i mean yeah. like, i think we, we like i think moviegoers are accustomed to dissecting movies a little bit more which is i think maybe which is why we do this yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> no, it's true. Exactly. That's the premise of this podcast yeah uh, which also i think is maybe a reason why movies have gotten a little formulaic with like things have to be very carefully set up and paid off because if we don't the audience will just call it like we call out stuff right away as like that's bullshit that would never happen like it has to be kind of like disguised pretty well if they're gonna pull some shit uh, but I feel like, yeah, these these older movies are just like, no, it's fun. Like, it's a movie. Like, the sword gets stuck in the concrete. Like, fun. Like, that's that's so over the top and crazy. Like, also, it works within the rules of this movie. Totally. Yeah. Like, within the rules of this movie, that sword could have cut that pillar in half. Yeah. Like, yeah, within totally. the confines of this movie. Totally. So, yeah. like, I don't know. I had no problem buying into those parts of the logic of this movie. Like, if, if these fights are magic, fine. <laughs> It's like more power to it, honestly. Another interesting point that I just thought of, Connor does not have a sheath for his sword, much like Duncan. No. He does. I mean, Ramirez does. He gets a oh, sword right. from Ramirez, yeah. and Ramirez has the sheath. I think it's just like, practically speaking, the way they chose to show it. We know a sheath exists. It's not like <laughs> yeah. it's not like in season one of Highlander where he literally has no sheath, and he's walking around with an exposed sword all the time. Right. <laughs> like, right. Then we get to see our first what we will call a quickening, because I had some questions of, is this the quickening Oh, or not? yeah. Because mm. they use that terminology very differently in this uh, movie. Yeah. Odd. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a big question mark. Yep. Uh, so, again, if you are if you follow the podcast and have heard our season one, we've the quickening in the, the television series Highlander, after they cut off a head, this immortal, Duncan McLeod usually, is struck by lightning and has like this crazy immortal orgasm 
Yeah. And that's the quickening. He gets the power from the other person. In this, it's it's very different the way it looks, and I don't know. It's much more kind of ethereal. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. one component of it. Also, there's this weird like magnetic lifting that happens, where like the bodies are like kind of lifted off the ground, and there is this. Electric- and the electricity is actually like emitted from the body, like yeah. whereas in the TV show, like like it's it's coming from the sky. Yeah, uh, yeah. So like yeah, Fasil's body like starts to raise, and like electricity is like escaping from it. And then all the cars are going crazy and exploding and shit. Like, which the quickenings in this, insofar as these are the quickenings, are rad. They're these amazing. Are yeah, cool. I, I think they're cool. Though I think profound confusion is probably the appropriate response to someone seeing this for the first time. But like now, with the context of more Highlander, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like it's much more individual. In a certain sense, like there's a lot more character to each of these, yeah, and they are way more orgasmic. Like we've we've joked about how like they're these immortal orgasms. Just to break this down, how much like orgasms this is, like straight up jizzing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> I mean, this is so sexual, yeah. Right, so. Connor is bathed in light. He literally groans and, like, makes this agonized expression with his face. There's, these cars are turning on, revving forward and splooging oil everywhere. Yeah. There's a hose that yeah, is hose. filling up yeah. with water and literally becoming engorged. And, <laughs> like, the cars all surge forward and then their glass explodes. Yeah. Like, this is so Very sexual. sexual. Like, it's really apparent. Even more so than the jokes in the movies. Right. Immortal orgasm. So <laughs> I want to I want to bring up two things here. So there's, I would say, a couple, there's, I mean, you could read a movie any different way. There's a couple different ways to, like, interpret the movie. Uh, one version is just that this is a fantasy, and it's about people that sword fight, and, you know, there's the game, the prize, all this stuff. But there's two other interpretations, and this is the first instance where I'm going to, I'm going to lay the seeds for this now, and I'm going to bring it up every time it comes up as just interesting things to think about uh i'm not saying that these are correct or this is the intent of the movie but it's something to think about uh so kyle as you said there's the sexual thing going on i completely agree this the 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 quickenings are definitely sexual in some way also we should mention what quickening is uh so the quickening is a medical term that's for when the heartbeat like a mother feels the heartbeat of a baby in her so some people, like, it used to be described as, like, the first point of life. So it, it's got this kind of, like, very interesting kind of, like, life force sort of quality to it. Um, so anyway, this is definitely very sexual, especially with the hose, uh, which is weird because that's not a machine, like, powered by electricity. Like, that is just a hose exploding. Yeah, but, yeah. like, this is, like, it's affecting mechanical things. Yeah. Like, it's not just, like, that there's this electricity going on and it's just causing these things. Like, someone somewhere a pipe was loosened. Yeah. <laughs> and water was allowed to escape. Right. Like, uh, so... One way to interpret this movie is there is a lot of maybe homoerotic imagery going on. And I'm just going to note that Russell Mulcahy is gay. And so I kind of wonder if any of that kind of bleeds through to this because he is he has not shied away from that before. Uh, he, has, he directed Billy Joel's Allentown. And I was actually just reading the other day an interview with Billy Joel who had not seen that video in a while. And he had just rewatched it and he was like... Yeah, he's like, that might be the gayest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it is, and, and then the, the, this interviewer uh, interviewed Russell about the video, and he was like, oh yeah, he's like, I intentionally like put as much homoerotic imagery into the video as I could. Like, it is mostly half-naked men turning knobs, showering, working out. Like, it's, it's like really homoerotic. So, I'm just going to plant the seeds here that there is a sexual thing, like, th- that this movie could be interpreted as kind of a sexual metaphor for homosexuality. Interesting. It's interesting. The other thing I want to bring up is uh, this is being an interesting uh, religious allegory. Uh, so when Connor has the quickening, he spreads his arms wide. There's a light from above. Uh, and so his arms are out like a cross. So there's a lot of like Christian symbology, I guess you would say, in this movie, uh, which is interesting. So I'm just going to throw that out there right now, and I'm going to keep bringing it up every time it comes up as just interesting ways to look at this movie. Hmm. Well, it helps that at this point in the Highlander mythos, we are never made aware of a female immortal ever. Yeah. It's strictly a thing between guys Mm -hmm. and they numerous times penetrate each other with their swords. No numerous times. Yeah. Just saying it, Mm. but all right, let's keep that alive. So after this fight, um, the main character who we, we don't know anything about yet, 
trench coat man. He stuff- still no zero 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 about him. He yep. stuffs his sword into like a uh, like a, a metal grate. That's yeah. Like he above. hears sirens and he's like, uh oh. Yeah. Um, so he ditches the sword. Yeah. And he runs off. And then mm-hmm. the camera pans up, and it's this really awesome transition where it goes kind of through the ceiling of the garage. And on the other side, it is the Scottish Highlands. Yep. Um, this is awesome. I think this it, is, this is a, I think, a fantastic opening to a movie. This is so good. Like, yeah. I'm into it. It's, it's great. It's profoundly confusing. <laughs> yeah. But it's excellent. Like, it's visually arresting. It's really cool. I'm, like, very into it. I think, like, just a touch more information, and this would be perfect yeah instead it's like visually awesome but i could see a lot of people without our and having a background in highlander i don't need it like right it's perfect kind of the way it is if you know all this shit but none of it existed at that point right yeah so i feel like if you're a completely blank slate this might be a little too unclear right especially without in the u.s cut without those little flashes the yeah tsd flashes in the beginning knowing that there's going to be any of this and yep. that these things are related because those flashes are what relates the two like mm-hmm. this this is just like a flashback this could be unrelated i suppose but when you have the juxtaposed images at the wrestling match it's like that's what tells you that th- these two things are connected but without those it's like what is happening I don't know. yeah so I don't know. I don't think I remembered how well shot and kind of executed a lot of the technical aspects of this movie were. And that's something I got a like a pretty hearty appreciation for these last two times. Yeah, sure. But I also don't think I had ever stopped and think tried to think about it from a position of someone with no information before. And yeah. I think that's something that's like a little confusing. Hey, fellow rewatchers, thanks again for joining us for our first Highlander motion picture podcast. Join us next week as we delve even further into Highlander mythology when we talk about flashbacks, police interrogation techniques, and more. Make sure to like us on Facebook and to subscribe to the podcast on any major podcasting platform for free Highlander content each and every week. Thanks again for listening. See you next week. We've been your rewatchers, Keith, Kyle, and Eamon. Bye. Bring on the girls. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>